So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Gaitel Omari. I am the, I'm a senior fellow here at the Washington Institute. Um, today, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Yossi Klein Halevi for the second installment of the Washington Institute National Book uh, Club webinar. Before I start the conversation with Yossi, let me start with some technical uh, issues. And I'm going to read uh, so as not to get it wrong. First of all, if you're joining us by tablet, you have the choice to turn your camera on or off by clicking the camera icon at the top of your blue jeans screen. We ask everyone to mute your computer or telephone until we get to the questions and answers portion of our webinar. I think in the last one there was some interference. To make sure there's no interference. You can do that by using the mute function of your phone or by clicking the microphone icon at the top of your blue jeans screen. If you have any technical difficulties during the call, please call Alex Rubin at 202-759-9485. She will help. Again, that's Alex Rubin, 202-759-9485. And now to the webinar. First of all, a welcome to all of the trustees who are joining us and uh, a note of gratitude for all of the support that you give to the Institute to make our work possible. And a welcome to Yossi. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, Yossi and I, I've read Yossi uh, for many years, but we had the pleasure to meet uh, three days ago, I think, in Connecticut. And I'm very, very honored to uh, welcome Yossi. A few words, you have his uh, CV, so I'm not going to go through the details, uh, but uh, highlights. Yossi moved to Israel in 1982, was it? Early 80s. Uh, I think you were a reporter for the Village Voice. I don't know when the Village Voice was a thing. Uh, prolific writer, many books, many uh, uh, articles. Uh, currently, Yossi is a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute. Uh, among the many things that he uh, is involved in is something that I uh, hold quite uh, dear is the Muslim Leadership uh, Initiative, and I think we will talk a, a bit about this uh, in our conversation. <clears throat> but let me start with the book. First of all, thank you for this really beautifully written, uh, emotionally written, thoughtful book. I truly enjoyed it, and I really learned a lot from it. I've been doing this for two and a half decades, and I'm surprised that I learned something about it. But I have to warn you, and I have to you know, maybe start with saying, it's a very deceptive book. It's a book that uh, I first, when I first picked it up, it's short. It looked like an easy afternoon uh, read. It's a very dense book. It deals with some very difficult uh, issues. And the title itself, it's a letter to your Palestinian neighbor. But, in, but what I saw in it is really something that every Israeli should read because it's a thoughtful reading of the Israeli narrative. Um, why did you choose this right, write this book, first of all? And secondly, as I was reading this book, um, it really struck me as a book that was an agonizing book to write. I, you know, as I'm reading it, every word seems to be uh, uh, carefully selected. Every idea seems to have been, you know, uh, dealt with with a lot of uh, uh, emotion behind it. So, why did you write this book? Can you tell us a bit about the process of writing this book for you as an author? Well, the book really uh, begins with a previous book. I, I mentioned that in the in the introduction, a journey that I took into uh, Palestinian society in the late 1990s. Um, the, um, the journey that, uh, that then became the basis for a book called At the Entrance to the Garden of Eden. And that book was really an attempt for me to listen and learn. I read Palestinian poetry and narratives, and I really tried to immerse uh, in the time that I spent, that year that I spent in Palestinian society, listening to people's stories, trying to, to understand. And then the second intifada came, and I became emotionally severed. And I effectively disowned the book that came out. And people would write to me saying, we read your book, it was interesting, it was moving. And I would write back, annoyed. <laughs> I would say, I would say why, why do you think that book really matters anymore? Look what's happening in the streets of Israel every day. And why do you think, because I happen to have had some interesting experiences with Palestinian Sufis, that that means anything? And, you know, because people would say, this gives me hope. I said, what hope? Hmm. There's no hope. There's no hope. And, uh, and so for 
for a while, really, the, the, um, I was in this very strange situation as a writer where I disowned my own book, emotionally disowned mm -hmm. it. And then you, you mentioned the Muslim Leadership Initiative, uh, which is uh, really the initiative of my friend and partner, Imam Abdullah Antepli of Duke University. And Abdullah writes me a, um, an email. I didn't know him in 2003 or four. I read your book and I want to take a reciprocal journey into Judaism. And I'm going to be bringing a group of, uh, of students. He was at the time at Wesleyan, a Muslim and Jewish student. Muslim, I'd like you to meet with. And I understood that this was a setup because he thought he was inviting that interfaith author. But the person who showed up was a typical mainstream angry Israeli. And I wasn't at all interested. And I told his students, forget it. Don't bother reading that book. And Abdullah said, OK, that's how you feel now. But one day you and I will work on trying to heal the Muslim Jewish wound. And that, to fast forward, we, we, we created this project, bringing Muslim American leaders to the Hartman Institute. The result of that project, I'd say several things happened. First of all, I realized that I can't continue being intimately involved with Muslim American leaders and not being involved with Palestinians across the way. And also, the, the book, the, the, the experience of being involved with, with Muslim American leaders gave me a language for how to speak to Muslims about Zionism, Israel, Jewish peoplehood. And so I applied what I learned in that program to this book. And again, I mean, when, when, you, when I read the book, it's, it's an interesting book. It's a mix of very tender, you know, the way you present your attachment and uh, all of these spiritual issues, very tender, but it's also brutal in the sense that you really don't pull punches, uh, both when it comes to the Israeli, to the Palestinian issues, back to that in a second. But as you describe the Israeli and the Jewish experience, also you're not sanitizing it. You are putting it with, you know, the good, the bad. Um, so how was that for you? I mean, I remember you telling me many years to write this book. Yeah, yeah, I've been working on this book probably six, seven years, on and off, not, not intensively. I would write a little bit and then move on to, to, to other projects. But and this, was, this kept pulling me back in. And I realized when it, when it was finished that I'd actually been writing this book for, for, for decades. And it was a conversation in my head for, for, for all those years with, with an imaginary power. And so the, um, the actual, you know, it, the difficulty was not in being honest about my, the difficulty paradoxically was to try not to be honest to the, about the Palestinians. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. This is something you and I have spoken about. The, 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 to my mind, the fatal flaw of Palestinian nationalism is its, its relentless um, focus on victimhood. It is a narrative born in victimhood, and and at crucial moments was uh, the Palestinian national movement, from my perspective, was unable to uh, to reach compromise because the 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 power of the victim narr narrative. And I wrote that in in several earlier drafts. It didn't didn't sound right. It sounded like as it is, this is a one way. Better. And, 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 and the danger of that is you could sound as if you're lecturing. And what, what I felt would mitigate that to some extent is if I wrote about myself and not write about my neighbor. And I say at one point, I'm not going to tell you how your national identity evolved. I did an earlier draft. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and so, so what I had to take out was, first of all, that. Uh, any any attempt to try to tell a Palestinian, you know, who you are, and the other, the, mo the most difficult challenge was the tone. How do you write in a way that 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 is respectful of your neighbor, but at the same and and as empathic as possible, but at the same time maintaining the integrity of your own narrative? How do you balance? On the book. Uh... 
I think maybe even the first, first paragraph of the first chapter, you set a very clear spiritual religious tone. I mean, you're sitting uh, facing the hills uh, as you're about to start your morning meditation. And the religious spiritual theme really uh, weaves through uh, all of that. Understandable, uh, I mean, you're a very spiritual uh, individual, and it's understandable because many Palestinians, most Palestinians, I would say, are religious, uh, and religion is a big part of the national identities. However, what about your non religious leaders, first of all? And secondly, you know, in practical terms, my own in, uh, encounter with religion in this has by and large been negative, has by and large been voices that actually are try are maximalists and try to uh, perpetuate the conflict. So first of all, why the religious tone? And then how do we turn the religious dialogue from one that is divisive as an absolute, absolutist to one that actually uh, achieves some of these issues and objectives that you want to achieve? So what, what um, I'd say where, where this book um, departs from the traditional uh, language of Middle East peacemaking, certainly from the Oslo model, is, is, is in three ways. Uh, the first is, uh, is its insistence on bringing narrative to the conversation, because I believe, as, as, as we've spoken about, that this is a conflict primarily not about tangibles, but intangibles. And the tangibles are a function of the intangibles of, of uh, identity, right to exist, legitimacy, memory, trauma, history. And, uh, and, and those are the elements that diplomats don't generally have the mm -hmm. tools to deal with. So I felt, first of all, each side needs to bring its story to, to the table. Second, and, 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 and we need to model a conversation over irreconcilable narratives. There's no way these narratives are going to meet. The second uh, departure is, is the insistence on bringing to the table, to the conversation, the legitimacy of each side's maximalist aspiration. And not to pretend that both sides really dream of partition. Neither side wants partition. And, and uh, it is, a, for, for, for both sides, uh, a tragedy. And, and a, a loss of a part of the land that is essential to who we are as a people. And so the starting point, not the end point, starting point needs to be each side frankly admitting that its aspiration is all of the land. I feel that way. For me, it's not the West Bank, it's Judea and Samaria, but I'm ready to give up part of what belongs to me so long as it is acknowledged that it belongs to me. In the same way that I respect the Palestinian maximalist claim, and I'm not disturbed, I write that in the book, I'm mm -hmm. not disturbed. By, by, by Palestinian maps that don't show the word uh, because my map doesn't show the name Palestine. So, and the third is religion. And generally, you know, in, in the West, I mean, the, 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 the assumption is, and it's not wrong, is that in our part of the world, religion is part of the problem, not part of the solution. But it will never be part of the solution if it's left outside the door. Because there, 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 there will be no reconciliation without some religious imprimatur. And that has never really been attempted. And the way that the Oslo process was perceived on both sides mm -hmm. was as a, a, an artificial peace between secular elites. And, and that, that simply won't work. So you ask about... Uh, about my, my non-religious readers. Now, on the Palestinian side, I wasn't worried about that question because I felt that, that most Palestinians, whether or not they're, they're observant, aren't, aren't deterred by religious language, quite the opposite. It, it, it makes the conversation more familiar, more comfortable. Uh, the question that I really had was with my American readers because obviously this book has two audiences in mind. There's the Palestinians, and, and I would say more broadly, the Arab world. And there's, there's the American audience, and in particular American Jews, and in particular young Americans, who are by and large secular. And so how am I writing to one audience in a religious voice when I'm clearly going to be alienating another audience 
uh, that uh, that is is not used to a religious voice. And I have to make a decision. Which is my primary audience? And by choosing to write this in a religious voice, I made a decision that my primary audience must be my neighbor. And that whoever is eavesdropping in on the conversation will have to live with that, with a Middle East hmm. dialogue. And, and in that sense, I think that, that I've, quote, gotten away with it. Because um, the responses that I've gotten, even from young secular American Jews, is okay. This is a conversation. This is we understand. This is a Palestinian-Israeli, and I think people should start getting used to the fact that whatever conversation is going to happen between Palestinians and Israelis uh, will need to have some religious context, and and the the validity of that was confirmed to me by some of the letters I got back from Palestinians. Uh, one young man wrote to me that I've never been able to consider any. Zionist narrative, but reading a religious Zionist narrative softened the blow for me. Interesting, so, very counterintuitive to the way yeah. that we've always seen it. Let me yeah. dig deeper on a couple of points that you raised. And the first one is, as, as you mentioned, you write in the book that you are not bothered by the Palestinians displaying a map that does not include Israel. You're probably the first Israeli that I've met who uh, <laughs> said something like this. This is something that understandably uh, deeply troubles many Israelis. But then you go on to proceed uh, to talk about, for example, the West Bank as Judea and Samaria. And you make a point of saying that for you, it will always be Judea and Samaria, which will be very jarring to many Palestinians reader, Palestinian readers. So how do you, I mean, how do you think is the best way to start these kinds of difficult conversations without getting the other side to shut down? How do you put down your, that position while at the same time keep an open window for conversation with the other side? So in the conversations that I do have with Palestinians, uh, or more broadly with, with people in the Arab world, or for that matter, uh, Muslims in America, uh, my starting point is I, I respect your claim to all of the land. For you, it is all of it is Palestine, including what I call the state mm -hmm. of Israel. OK, pause. Ah, great. <laughs> and the reason that I can respect your maximalist claim is because I also have a maximum. And to some extent, that, that is irreconcilable, but there are practical solutions. In the real world, you don't always get what you want. Both the Rolling Stones, <laughs> you're familiar. Very familiar, yes, thank you. <laughs> so, and, uh, so the, 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 but the starting point needs to be an honest conversation about our attachments. And I'm asking you not only to listen to my attachment, but to respect the historical attachment, which I don't believe I have the right to implement politically, because then that will come at your expense. Just as I respect your historical attachment to all of the land. I have the three things. I don't believe that you have the right three things to the top and what's the that mm -hmm. that claim, because yeah. that Will then deny my ability to exercise national sovereignty. So, so we need to separate. Uh, and one of the Palestinians who wrote me said this beautifully. He said, he said we have to separate the right from the return. And, uh, and what that really means is that each state will be the repository of its people's return, but not the land. And we have to separate the land from the state. And, and that's, you know, I, I, I feel that the two peoples never internalized the moral logic of partition. The moral logic of partition is that this is a little land that both sides have, have, have legitimate claim to, to all of the land. That's the starting point for, for, for morally expecting, for, for me to expect the other side to compromise on what it believes is theirs, because I'm going to do it. And so that's the move that we need to make explicit. Now, for, for those of you who sat for years around the negotiating table, you understood the move. But the publics didn't, I, I would argue, did not understand moral basis for partition. And I'm not sure we did, and I will get back to that in a minute. But uh, let me, again, dig a bit deeper and go more concrete on this. One thing that uh, I don't know if we mentioned, but uh, 
you've translated the book and you put it up for a free download, if I believe, in Arabic. And you will be coming uh, out with the uh, paperback soon in which you will include some of these uh, responses from Palestinian, uh, your neighbors, and I understand even from a Jordanian in one of those cases. And an Egyptian writer. And an Egyptian writer. So what is the overall, I mean, if you want to categorize some of the responses that you got from Palestinians, what kind of responses did you get from Palestinians? So the uh, there were two kinds. There was the one or two lines of threat uh, and hatred uh, on my Facebook page. Uh, the armies of Muhammad are coming to get you. We're coming to burn and you. you mm. You're a liar. You have no history. That was one response and a fair number. A second response were long, thoughtful emails by people who had clearly read the book and were <laughs> on different points. And I've chosen 12 of the best of those letters. They will now be included in this new epilogue. And the, those voices will have the last word in the book. And I felt that that was necessary, first of all, to honor their goodwill and their courage, and secondly, to now try to model what a respectful disagreement over, over our rival narratives and sound like. And these letters, what they all have in common are several things. One is they deeply disagree with my 1948, 1967, 2000. At the same time, I would say all of the letters are ready to accept the indigenousness of the Jewish people in this land. And they see that as a tragedy for their people. And, and I, I understand that. As, as I see the presence of the Palestinians as a tragedy for us as well. It, 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 Jewish people would have returned to a land that really was empty. Just waiting. Oh, there is no. Brian, sorry, wasn't available. Good to see you. Um, if, if you, we can if you uh, um, yeah. uh, yeah. whoever has, you know where I am. Stop it. Uh, okay. So Thank we you. don't have interference. Thank you. So. So that was the, 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 the th those were some of the, the common threads running through, mm -hmm. through these letters. Uh, we, we deeply disagree with your version of the conflict. We accept your 4,000 year connection. And for me, you know, you know, the, the word Dayeno, which, you know, enough, that was, that was enough. If you're ready to deal with me on the basis of mm -hmm. my indigenousness, and not to tell me, go back to America, or this one, go back to Russia. Of course, you never hear Palestinians say, uh, go back to Yemen or Morocco or Iraq. It's always Poland and Russia and, and America. But if you're ready, and the letter writers that I published are all ready to accept the indigenousness of the Jewish people, and that I'm there not as a Jew from Brooklyn, but as part of a repatriating people, then I will, I'm ready to engage with you on any and every disagreement. So that was, the, the, mm. I would say that that, that was the, the, the general parameter of, uh, of the letters. Some of the tone, the, some, some, there were tones that were more conciliatory. Some of the letters accused me of being a propagandist. That's okay. I understand why it would sound that way to, to some Palestinian readers. Uh, I think others wrote that they understood that I was not deliberately disseminating falsehoods, that this was really my narrative. And, uh, and I think that that's a major step forward. I mean, and I, now I know it's not your audience, that your target, but uh, I'm curious, what was the reaction from Israelis and particularly uh, as a religious uh, Israeli, what was the reaction from uh, Israelis who are have the the religious uh, sense of uh, connection to the land. Uh, well, the, the book has not yet come out in Hebrew. Okay. Uh, it's being translated now. And I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm a bit relieved that it hasn't come out right away because I felt the, I needed to deal with different audiences and stages. Mm -hmm. And the Israeli conversation will be very different, obviously from the Palestinian conversation, but even from the American Jewish conversation. The Israeli conversation, first of all, uh, there, there. This is, this is. I'm, I, it's, it's a strange book for an Israeli. Imagine. 
because I'm writing not only to my neighbor, I'm also writing to their neighbor. Now I'm back on something. That uh, ostensibly um, most Israelis know. I'm not sure that they do, but in principle, most Israelis mm -hmm. know this story. And so uh, there'll be lots, uh, the, the few Israelis who have read it, uh, some friends at the Hartman Institute that I've circulated it around a bit, uh, the pushback is, 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 well, you got this part of the narrative wrong, or you've overemphasized religious Zionism, uh, where is secular Zionism? And so um, it's, I think that the challenge to Israelis will be how is understanding that the way that we tell our story to the Middle East, not necessarily the way we tell our story to ourselves. And, and this is, you know, it's, and what, what I tell, what I tell Jews and Israelis is that we have tried to tell our story to all kinds of constituents. You know, there's even a, a pro-Israel organization that opened up an office in China. And, and we've never actually tried to tell our story to our neighbors. And the Jordanian guy that I mentioned to you, who wrote me the terrific letter, which I included in the epilogue, ended one of his letters by saying, and this is a quote, what the hell took you guys so long to finally tell us your story? And I almost felt that that should be the, the epigraph of the mm. book, because that's exactly the point. We never bother telling our neighbors our story. Who are we? What are we doing here? Oh, um, to move on to a different topic, maybe, uh, you know, one of the things that really struck me reading the book is the way that you look at uh, a two-state solution, the partition of the land, as a tragedy, as a source for mourning. Now, you know, as negotiators, the way we often wanted to sell it to our public is, as a happy uh, thing, as a win-win. You talk about it as almost as a lose-lose, as something that we will have to mourn. First of all, where are we being, I don't know, too American and trying to kind of just look at the bright side, where we're hurting the process of not recognizing uh, the, the, the sacrifice that has to be made? Or do we risk too much by focusing on the uh, loss aspect of it, of uh, pushing constituencies away? Uh, my answer to the first question is absolutely. We were too American. Too American, too <laughs> okay. Western, and not, not at all sensitive to the trauma of what this meant on, on, on both sides. And, and I remember as an initial supporter of the opposition, I became disillusioned pretty quickly. Um, I, I did not believe that this was going to, to lead anywhere good, but initially I was, I was a supporter. And but even when I was a supporter, I felt torn. And, and I partly identified with the cry that was happening in the Israelis. How can you tear this land away from us? And dare to, to turn this into a celebration. And I found, again, even as a supporter of Oslo, I found the celebratory movement. I remember one of the Israeli newspapers, Idiot Achorvo, uh, published right after the signing of the White House lawn, published a special supplement in its economic section of how much you as an Israeli are going to earn from this piece. I'm thinking, you're telling me I'm selling Hebron so that I'll have an extra 3,000 shekel a year? You know, that's, that's the trade-off. And, and I remember the drawing. It was a dove with a, with a coin in its mouth. Wow. And, and it was so vulgar. Wow. And, and the way that the piece was sold was, was, was with, such, with such insensitivity to, to Jewish religious sensibility, historical sensibility. And I'm sure a similar process was happening uh, to one extent or another on the other side. Yeah. And so there are no shortcuts. You can't circumvent a people's deepest attachments and then tell that people, no, it's okay, you'll make some money on it. Maybe some people will, will go for it, but... I mean, this is, uh, in my view, very relevant today as ideas like economic peace and whatnot uh, keep popping up. I think this is something to remember. Now, there's a lot to ask, but let me jump to my penultimate question and then we'll open it up. Uh, one of the things that you write, and of course, you know, it, it, it uh, spoke to me directly when you were criticizing the diplomats like myself and like some of my colleagues here, 
for uh, going don't really. <laughs> I don't. Uh, but you, know, you criticize us for uh, going almost for the tangibles and ignoring the intangibles. Now, you know, I understand where you're coming from. This is a conflict that happens in a context, and it's a very spiritual, very narrative context. However, the few times that we did try in the negotiations to deal with the uh, intangibles, it got us nowhere. To give you an example, uh, in one of the, those uh, rounds, we were asked, I was asked to negotiate with my Israeli counterpart a common narrative of what happened in 1948. We could not get over the basic question, was 1948 a good year or a bad year? You talked about, actually, you know, a quote from your book, my protection is your vulnerability, my celebration is your defeat. The nature of these issues that you were talking about almost defy the very essence of negotiations. You talk about identity, how can you uh, compromise on identity? And this is what negotiations uh, are about. So are we overloading the process if we ask uh, the negotiators to deal with these issues? Um, can we separate the political from the narrative? How do we deal with this, with this tension between these two issues? I think that, that you, you've proven that negotiators don't have the tools to deal with. And in, in the example that you raised, which is the attempt, which was doomed to failure from the beginning, to create a, a common narrative. There is no common narrative. They, there's, there's no common narrative between redemption and Nakba. <clears throat> That's, that, there is an abyss, and that abyss will remain. The, the question, though, is can we learn a way in which we speak about our opposing narrative? And this, look, this book is an experiment. It's nothing more than that. And it's an experiment that, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't really been tried. There, there was a, an interesting book that was published, so you know it, The Dual Narratives. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but that's, you know, that's very dry. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the first attempt that I can think of, of, that's, that's of, of to bring conflicting narratives from personal perspective. And when I publish the Palestinian responses, then it really will model what that mm -hmm. sounds like. And there is no way, you, you, reading this book and then reading the Palestinian, there's no way to bridge those, those narratives. And yet, if we don't acknowledge those narratives, they will continue to reassert and overwhelm any attempt to, to move beyond the, the, the past. And so the only way that I believe that we can, we can overcome the past neutralize the past is by honoring it. Because Jews and Arabs, we are not existentialist beings severed from, from history. We're, we, are, we are immersed in our story. We have to bring our stories to the conversation. And, and each side needs to do, to, you know, I think there was this fear on both sides that, that a peace process really means leaving your history and the two sides need to be reassured that you're hit, you are not giving up the, your past for the future. You know, I mean, you're actually throwing a challenge to the policy world, the policy community. How do we take that and translate it into a policy? And that, that should be an interesting one to actually dig deeper. Now, before I go, I mean, I have to ask you this question. I think I know your answer. But uh, you know, generally speaking, when we talk about Israeli-Palestinian affairs, it ends up being an extremely depressing conversation. Um, so, and some of the issues that we were just talking about actually are very difficult ones. The, we, we skimmed the surface, but these are difficult issues. So, you know, to write a book like this book, I assume you have to have a reservoir of hope somewhere. You just don't write this kind of book if you've given up. Where do you see the hope? Give us, you know, where do you see signs of hope in the future? I think the, the changes that are happening in the region, you here at the Institute are, uh, are really the not, not you don't only study them. I think you're also helping to some extent catalyze changes. I think that uh, that that creates a sense of dynamism, which which makes the status quo to some extent the same. Status quo can erupt at any moment from any direction. It's far more likely that we're going to see war in the next year or two than, than peace. And I wish the Trump administration's initiative really all, all the success. 
hard to. I, said, I asked you for the hope. It's hard to be optimistic. <laughs> well, the hope, yeah, I would say that this is a hard Israeli uh, version of optimism, which is that that the status quo is not going to last indefinitely, and and I do believe that that some major conflict is coming. And what we've seen in the past is, uh, I mean, we saw Sadat's initiative following uh, Yom Kippur, and uh, I. I, look, it could get it could get far worse. That's that's certainly one one outcome. And if if Netanyahu is reelected and we have a hard right government, it could it could opt for for annexation of Area C, and then we're really we're in a totally different. <clears throat> but <clears throat> excuse me, but because the Middle East is so fluid, and because we're at a particularly intense uh, moment in in the in the history of the Middle East, uh, I think it's premature to write off any option, even the option of a of a breakthrough in negotiation. Thank you. I mean, there's so much to discuss, and I'm sure we, you and I, will have a lot to talk about offline. But I think it's time to go now to uh, uh, to our trustees. And before I open it up, let me just again some of the logistics. Um, to ask a question, unmute your line and speak up. You can text your question to us at 410-241-1326. Please include your name in the text message. Again, that's 410-241-1326. And I already actually have uh, a couple of people who uh, jump, who uh, uh, express an interest. Um, we're going to start with uh, Jeanette Reinhardt. Jeanette, the floor is yours. EOC, uh, in the context of where you just left that last question, I guess, with uh, hey, um, you were a member of Betar. What is your reaction to the recent integration of the Kahanis movement into the Likud political equation? Is this going to help us get to where we need to go? Well, not only was I a member of Betar, but I graduated from Betar to the Kahanists when I was 17. So uh, I didn't put that in the book. I felt that would really be a conversation <laughs> stopper. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in my in my teenage years, I was a follower of Mayor Kahana. I, it wasn't quite the Mayor Kahana that we knew in Israel. It was it was a bit of a different uh, cause, and, and, and uh, he hadn't yet devolved into the racist Kahana that we. Nevertheless, the violence, the, the love of violence, the extremism, that was all, all there. And I, I feel that what Netanyahu has done by bringing the Kahanas into the Israeli mainstream uh, is poison the political system and, and compromise us to a point where, the, for me, I feel that Netanyahu has become uh, one of the the corrupt ancient kings of Israel, who 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 weakened the moral immune system of 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 Israel, and we're facing so many serious strategic threats. We can't afford to to uh, erase our most minimal moral moral foundation. That's what he's done. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you, Yossi. Um, uh, the next question, uh, the second one, I think uh, we have Shelley, Shelley Kassen. Hi, Yossi. Hi, Ray. Hi, thank, you, thank you so much for uh, conducting this interview. Um, my question is really about the internal divisions on each side. Uh, we see it playing out uh, within Israel. Yossi, you just alluded to it uh, politically. And within the Palestinian community as well, uh, we see what's going on now. You know, uh, with with uh, in Gaza, neither side is actually anything like monolithic. Deep divides and distress. How do we cut through on either side to to have hope uh, going forward when when the divisions are so deep? Well, I. I... I feel some hope here and here. This I'll give you a little bit of hope in terms of the domestic Israeli debate. In that, 
the debate is no longer between the right and the left in Israel. It's between the right and the center. The left has pretty much vanished for all practical purposes. The, the, the Israeli left, if it exists anywhere as a potent force, it's in the American Jewish community. It, it has no chance of, uh, of reclaiming government. And, uh, and so the debate has shifted to an opposition, a centrist opposition to the right, which is far more realistic, far more grounded in the realities of the Middle East, and more respected by Israelis of 2019. The, whether, uh, whether Gantz ter turns out to be the most effective candidate or not is a separate question. I, I, I'm, I, I fear that he's, he's a mediocre candidate, uh, as he probably was a mediocre chief of staff. He, he, he was not the person that really should have led the center, but as we say in Hebrew, Zamayesh, that's what we have. And, uh, but, but more significant is the emergence of a, of a credible post-Oslo, post-Second Intifada opposition to the right. And, and, and the American Jewish community has to start getting used to the fact that its allies, uh, the liberal American Jewish community, its allies, uh, its most effective allies are not the Israeli left. It's not breaking the silence of B'Tselem, groups that you never hear about in Israel, the Israeli center. And so, so on the Palestinian issue, the center and the right agree with, on many issues, but they, they, they agree, for example, uh, on the, the fact that uh, uh, there's no chance anytime soon for a peace breakthrough. That, that's a normative Israeli position. They also agree on the, on, on the perception of almost all Israelis that the breakdown of the peace process was not Israel's fault, but the Palestinian leadership. Uh, and the center agrees with the right that, in principle, all the land is ours. These, these are normative uh, positions that are shared by center and right. But the center agrees with the left that the only worse alternative to a two-state solution is a one-state solution. And so we need to do everything we can to begin shifting away from a one-state. And, uh, and so I see the Israeli divide today on the Palestinian issue as much more realistic and much more mature that sense than, than in the past. Thank you. And again, I mean, I'm not going to take your time enough to say that uh, I do believe that we focus too much on the bilateral and we forget that you need legitimate uh, leaders on both sides to uh, make these kind of decisions. Much this has to be an internal process by each society and they have to work it through. We can help one another. And I believe this kind of conversation and what you're initiating in the book is one of the issues that we can help one another in terms of clarifying at least that there is a, a, a partner not in the practical uh, policy sense as well, only, but a partner who is willing to deal with these kinds of issues with a degree of honesty. Now, that said, actually, this is a good segue uh, to the third question, which is a question that we re received uh, in writing, and this from our trustee, Phyllis Leventhal, with the following commenting question, and I will read. Thank you for the soulful rendering of Hatikva, uh, hitting all the right notes. Do you imagine your brother Antepli, Imam uh, Abdullah, is ready to write uh, you a similar heartfelt letter? And if I may add to this, you know, what do you want in response to this book from uh, the Palestinians, from your uh, uh, partners in that uh, conversation? So what I want is um, is what I is what I did get. I got letters back from Palestinians ready to engage with me on. The, the presence of two indigenous people in this land. And Abdullah is not necessarily my partner in this conversation. Abdullah is Turkish. He'd be the first to say, I can't speak for him. Not my, my place. And, um, and so I, I'm really looking more for, no, I'm looking for conversations with anyone in the Arab world and anyone in the Muslim. That's, that's for sure. But my, my, obviously, my most immediate concern is to trigger some kind of conversation with Palestinians. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not, I'm not a diplomat, just a writer. And I can't bring peace. But what writers do have a responsibility, try to model what a conversation of peace might sound like. What I try to do here is to create a centrist 
Israeli language for peace, that non-left-wing, non-secular Israelis might feel comfortable. That was my responsibility, and to see if I can evoke a response from uh, from the other side. But if, if I may also, just since we're on the topic of MLI and uh, Imam Abdullah, who I have met before, who I have tremendous respect for, um, but in general, when you have these interfaith conversations, and my understanding is most of your interlocutors are actually not Palestinian or Palestinian Americans, does this issue resonate? Is there is this an issue that impacts the interfaith uh, conversation, or is it it remains on the, if you wish, jurisprudential uh, uh, level. What, what our project, uh, Muslim Leadership Initiative, MLI, uh, what we do is begin with the Israeli Palestine. And, and usually what happens in Muslim Jewish interfaith efforts, certainly in this country, is that uh, you try to look for commonalities. And it becomes sweet. We're children of Abraham. And that's all very nice, except that the, the descendants of Abraham are killing each other. And anytime something happens in the Middle East, uh, it, it, it impacts on these well-intentioned, but often superficial efforts to, to bring Muslims and Jews together. And an, an example uh, in current Muslim-Jewish interfaith conversations in America is that uh, there's an attempt to say, we're going to focus on a shared threat of white supremacy. Now, that's fine except that Muslims and Jews also see each other as threat. And the Ilan Omar incident is a, is, is, is a classic example of that. And so how do, you, how do you unite over a shared enemy when at the same time you see the other, the other as an enemy? So this is very much part of our, our work. I would say, in some sense, it's, it's the defining aspect of our work. Interesting. I see. Uh, is there any more uh, audio questions? Because I see we have a uh, written question here. Oh. So, and this is a question. I'm sorry, I didn't see who it's from. But uh, what is the level of people-to-people -people, uh, interaction between Israelis and Palestinians in the And uh, I mean, I would also add, you know, this is an issue that maybe in the 90s would not really have to face because there was an organic interaction between the two people. Certainly since yeah. Oslo and certainly since the Second Intifada, we've also lost this kind of organic interactions that we used to have. So what is the state of this? Uh, well, look, I think the, the most telling response that I can offer is that many of the letter writers asked me not to use their names. And... And or even those who said I can use their names in English that don't use it in Arabic. And we have a website now in Arabic. And, uh, and so I have to be very careful what I translate from English. And the fact that, that you know, and none of these letter writers betrayed the Palestinian cause. Mm -hmm. They all, you, you, you read some of those letters. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're, there's tremendous integrity and, and solid, national solidarity. And yet, even, that, even then, they, couldn't feel, they wouldn't feel comfortable or perhaps safe putting their names to, uh, to the letters. So there, there is some people to people work still going on. There's, but it happens mostly in Jerusalem um, or among, among Palestinian Israelis and Jewish Israelis. That tends to be. Where it's concentrated. I mean, you touch on a point that I've been agon you know, agonizing about for a while. You know, David Makovsky and I, we go to campuses, we engage in some of these dialogues, and I've always been curious, and I really have no answer. Can we, from the United States, impact this this sense of uh, conversation uh, in the region? Can can our people to people here replace uh, uh, your people to people on the ground? Or are we, uh, or do we have the standing for this? Do we have the impact for this? Or, or is the conversation forever going to be defined by what happens by, between Palestinians and Israelis? Look, I, I, I understand the problematics, but you never know, especially in the age of social media, when, when information is so permeable, you never know the impact. And, and if we're not able to engage in kinds of conversations, certainly not openly, there, then 
we need to engage in those conversations wherever we can. I did a campus tour recently with one of the Palestinians who wrote me a letter. Now, we can't do that back home, but we were able to do that here. And whether it has any significance or not, I don't know. Whether this has any significance, really not. But what I do hope is that what our efforts, all of our efforts, are doing is trying to create a language so that when we, if and when we ever do get back to the table, maybe we will have, uh, have, have, have a new way of, of speaking about these issues, you know, and, and because the old way is, it's, it didn't work. No, I, there's no. Yeah, um, if there are no more questions uh, from the trustees, I actually, there's a question that I wanted to ask and I dropped, uh, so let me get back to it. Um, you know, one theme that comes across, uh, comes through in the book is uh, a sense that uh, while this is a Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, actually both peoples, and I don't know, should I say, burdened by or blessed by the fact that they actually don't only speak for themselves. What do I mean? You spend a lot of time in uh, your book explaining the relation between uh, Israel and the Jewish faith and Israel and the diaspora. I mean, you look at Israel uh, uh, in the, the spiritual way, not as a state in the kind of technical sense that I would understand, but also something that, so, so certainly uh, as an Israeli negotiator, you also have to be cognizant of the uh, uh, Jewish world. And you also talk about the Palestinians as, uh, yes, they are maybe a minority in this conflict, yet they are part of a regional majority. And you actually present them as Arabs, as Muslims. Uh, and indeed, I mean, when I was a negotiator, we knew that certain issues like the holy site, etc., that we cannot as Palestinian negotiators address without uh, the, uh, at least being cognizant of the region and of the uh, Muslim world. So. First of all, my question to you is, can you, is it possible for Palestinian and Israelis to make peace or do we need to include the, the other stakeholders? And in this case, in, in specifically here, you know, to focus on today, the Emirati, United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Anwar uh, Gergash, um, did actually say uh, what I've heard many Arab leaders say privately, but he said it publicly, we made a mistake, we, the Arab world, made a mistake of not uh, engaging Israel uh, from the beginning. So do you see some of these developments that we're seeing recently of more under the table and over the table engagement between the Arabs and Israel? Is this a good sign? Is this something that will enable us to move uh, to get closer? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what gives me hope. And I, I understand that it's still a slim hope. Uh, nevertheless, this is something that didn't exist the, uh, I mean, you're right. There are there are many shareholders in this conflict, and I'll 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 speak only only from my side, and that is that that Israelis and 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 you know this you you know Israelis you know our psyche, we 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 think of of our strategic situation uh, in 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 two ways. It's as if there's a split screen in our head, one side of the screen Israel and the Palestinians. And we're Goliath and they're David. The other side is Israel and the region. And until the last few years, we were we we saw ourselves at least as David or at least vulnerable, and the region as as threatening. And so the 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 more we bring the region into into the the the, the negotiating process, the the more we 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 directly address complicated Israeli psyche because to just focus on a bilateral Israeli negotiating track does not address the the complexity of of my dilemma. And and this is really the first time that I feel maybe something can and then and here again beyond the um, the practical you know, the David and Goliath in that uh, sense. Um, we're seeing in the Arab world right now more willingness to actually look at issues that affected Jewish history. 
particularly the issue of uh, the Holocaust. I mean, one of our uh, former fellows here, Mohammed Dajani, who I know that you know, uh, has been a wrote, trailblazer. A terrific letter. Yeah, uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, and even one of our uh, forum visitors, uh, 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 Sheikh Mohammed Laisa uh, of Saudi Arabia, recently also wrote a book, uh, another book, pardon me, uh, an, an, an oh, article well. in the Post and I think in Newsweek, and then most importantly in Oqaz, uh, Saudi uh, newspaper uh, in Arabic. And I see maybe uh, still on the margins uh, some re-examination of the history of the Jewish people in the Arab world and the expulsions and the refugees who were made refugees by whether well, mainly in Iraq. Uh, so as you look at your engagement with the region and the role of the region, do you see it simply as, uh, you know, in the in the terms that I would understand as a policy person? Or do you feel that there is an importance for an engagement on some of the themes that you actually deal with in your own book? Yeah, yeah, look, absolutely. I. I, you know, we, we've lost we've lost two generations on the Israeli side of Jews from Arab Muslim countries who would have been able to culturally engage. And Joseph Browdy has just mm-hmm. written, of course, mm-hmm. this terrific book which you published here, and, and I'm I'm a great admirer of Joseph's and work, and I think that that's exactly the direction we need to go in. And the title of his book, you know, Reclamation is telling because we don't have a, 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 a strong living cultural force to draw on. It's going to have to be really recreated to some extent. We've lost, we've lost two generations and, and, and the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the Jews who came from, from the Middle East are, are as Israeli as, as, as Ashkenazi kids, which means that they have lost their, their Middle East sensitivities to, to a large extent. And so, 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 but this is the work that uh, that that I feel urgently needs to be done, and I have been following partly through through Joseph, the uh, the the changes in at, sporadic, but nevertheless, we 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 haven't heard these voices at all in the past within the Arab world of of people beginning to ask the question of what well, what actually happened to those. And where did they end up? And did the fact that they end up in Israel, does that have some significance for us and how we see Israel? So that, that gives me hope. Okay, so we are coming now towards the end of this. Uh, we can go on forever, and I'm sure you and I will continue going this conversation for a long time. But let me actually conclude with contradicting you on a positive note. And to say that actually what I see coming out of Israel now um, is a lot of new Israeli uh, cultural products, particularly music, that actually are rooted a lot of the a lot of the Mizrahi tradition, and especially in music, and this is making inroads in the Arab world. Uh, I mean, I'm not in my day job, but I really I follow the uh, musical scene in the Arab world, making amazing inroads that I see they have done probably better than your book than in in reaching the message. I'm I'm being facetious here, but however, I mean, I would really want to conclude by thanking you for two things. Thanking you for writing this book. Uh, I think this is both courageous and and essential in uh, widening the conversation, but also, frankly, allowing us in the Washington Institute to move away from what we usually do. We usually talk about policy, important, and that's, of course, very important. But I think these kinds of conversations are the ones that we could need to have more because this is ultimately the context, the foundation that we work within. So thank you so much for it. Uh, thank you for all our trustees thank for being you, here. Ed. Thank you, and, and I just want to thank the Washington Institute and Shelley. Really, it was just a pleasure to be with all. Thank you for, for adopting the book. Appreciate it. Thank you.